All right. Well, welcome, everyone. You are joining the Confronting Environmental Racism and Promoting Environmental Justice webinar series. This series is co-organized by the MLEAD Community Engagement Corps, the Stakeholder Advocacy Board for the MLEAD Center, and the Integrated Health Sciences Corps. We're delighted to have you join us today. My name is Amy Schultz, and I am the co-lead for the Community Engagement Corps for the MLEAD Center. We can advance to the next slide. All right. We are uh, joining you today from the lands of the Anishinaabe, uh, the Three Fires Confederacy of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi, um, where we are settlers. Um, and this land was stewarded by the Three Fires Confederacy, along with their neighbors, the Seneca, the Delaware, the Shawnee, and the Wyandotte nations, who cared for and lived on this land um, from which we are presenting for many generations. Um, we uh, believe, uh, we want to acknowledge, renew, and affirm the ancestral and contemporary ties of the Anishinaabe to this land, and we're grateful for the opportunity afforded us to pre present from this place. Um, we believe firmly that understanding the history of genocide and settler colonialism that underlies um, this nation's history is essential to uh, finding ways to dedicate our scholarship, our teaching, and our practice to um, addressing the, the uh, underlying health inequity or the underlying inequities that drive health inequities. We can go to the next slide. Today, we're delighted um, as part of the Residents and Researchers webinar series uh, to introduce uh, our presenting team. They're going to be talking with us about a, um, a very exciting project that they have been working on for a number of years using community-based participatory research to address immigrant uh, workers' health and safety. And we're delighted our panelists include Sherry Barron, who is with the Barry Commoner Center for Health and the Environment at Queens College, College. Um, Isabel Cuervo, um, also with the Barry Commoner Center for Health and the Environment at Queens College. And Daisy Flores is the third presenter. She is with Make the Road in New York, um, and I will be moderating the session. I am going to turn it over at this point to our presenters. All right, so thank you, um, Amy and team. So my name is Isabel Cuervo, and I'll be introducing our study, The Safe and Just Cleaners, or Limpieza Digna y Segura, a community-based participatory research study located in the New York City area. Our study focused on house cleaners' health and safety issues, but much of what we are, will present today is also experienced by other immigrant Latinx workers in precarious employment. Next slide. Sherry, my colleague at Queens College and PI of the study, will present our research findings, and Daisy, our co-PI from our community partner, Make the Road New York, will present activities related to the action component of the project. Make the Road is uh, the largest member-based, community-based organization in New York City and provides programs and advocacy for immigrant workers. This slide features some of our other main personnel, including our co-PI, Omero Arari, at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He is our other academic partner who leads the exposure science research activities. We are grateful for the over 25 research assistants, interns, and worker participants we have had over the life of the project. Next slide, please. Previous research, including cross-sectional and epidemiologic studies, has found that house cleaners are at an increased risk of developing respiratory and dermatologic effects, especially higher rates of asthma, rhinitis, decreased pulmonary function, and dermatitis. Next, please. In cleaning products, there are three important chemical components, bleach, volatile organic compounds, and quaternary ammonium compounds that all have been associated with these health outcomes. Next, please. Spraying products directly onto surfaces also increases exposure. Mixing some of them can lead to serious consequences, including death. Next, please. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> back. Another area of chemical interest in the is the addition of scent to the products that are part of their formulation. 
Now next. To address these health concerns, we received a five-year grant from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences under the Research to Action funding mechanism. Our main objectives for what became our para grant are to measure household uh, cleaners' exposures to toxic components of cleaning products and to develop a campaign to reduce these exposures. Next. Our three aims are to survey 400 immigrant Latinx house cleaners to learn what products they use and how they use them, their working and employment conditions, and their knowledge and attitudes about those cleaning products. Next. Our second aim involves obtaining quantitative exposure assessments. And finally, our third is to develop a multi-level prevention campaign. Next slide. We'd like to take a moment to introduce how we have applied CBPR principles in our study. We, while we were guided by all of them, we'll focus on a few for our talk today. Our team recognizes that each CBPR project is unique in implementing these principles, which sometimes was challenging for all those involved, but our collective commitment to support this population's access to improved working, health, and life conditions guided us through our process. Next. To help establish and maintain equitable project practices, we structured funding so that all three partners received an equal amount. Representatives of each of the organizations met weekly and oftentimes more for more than five years if you consider the time for pilot data collection and planning to kick the project off. While our study was grounded by important scientific evidence, we collectively determined to pursue research on work exposures in house cleaning. This study extended previous collaboration we, we had with Make the Road, where we were studying and implementing health and safety programs involving exposures to chemicals and other work hazards among construction and cleanup workers, who are primarily men. We all had interest in continuing this line of inquiry with women workers, and Make the Road New York also wanted to enhance their engagement with house cleaners, as many of their members engage in domestic work. Next. For the researchers on the team, we understood that factors beyond the use of products could lead house cleaners to use them in ways that might increase exposure, such as how they are often told to clean by their clients. But Make the Road New York pushed us to expand the breadth of questions we should ask about employment conditions of these workers because they were also interested in being able to use these data to support current or emerging campaigns. With Make the Road, we also designed our theoretical framework, research questions and measures. We collaboratively conducted data collection, analysis and writing and other forms of dissemination. And we all thought it was important to involve research participants in activities as early as possible and increase their levels of engagement as the project evolved. Next. To balance research needs with those of the community, we prioritize our dissemination efforts to first support educational and policy initiatives important to our participants. For example, we created a training program for and by workers and two data reports before focusing on writing academic articles. You'll hear more about this dissemination from Daisy later on, but first I'll hand it over to Sherry, who will now present our key research findings. Thanks, Isabel, and thanks to the organizers for inviting us. As you heard, uh, the first aim of our study was to collect survey data from household cleaners to better understand their work practices and exposure conditions. To design our survey, we used formative research with seven focus groups. We were interested in learning how the cleaners made decisions about which cleaning products they used and how they used them. The cleaners helped us to focus our exposure assessment on tasks done in the kitchen and bathroom where they reported using the most products. We also learned that although there are hundreds of different products on the market, there were fewer than 50 that were most commonly used. Finally, we learned a lot about the house cleaners employment conditions and how those conditions may influence the way the cleaners used cleaning products. To better understand these employment conditions, we drew on a multidimensional employment quality framework developed by Van Arden and others and applied this framework to our study. 
As depicted here, we knew from previous research that cleaning tasks led to chemical exposures, which then produced irritant health effects, eventually leading to more long-term physical health problems and likely also to adverse mental health. We hypothesized that employment conditions, such as the stability of employment, the level of earnings, violations of workers' rights, unstable work hours, and problems with unbalanced power relations with their clients would be important to explaining cleaners' health. We hypothesized that effects of poor employment quality could directly affect health, but could also indirectly affect health by leading to work practices that produce higher levels of chemical exposures. Using this framework, we developed survey items and fielded our survey between August 2019 and February 2020. It was an in-person interviewer-administered survey that lasted about an hour. We recruited Spanish-speaking cleaners from four boroughs in New York City and suburban Westchester in collaboration with our community partner, Make the Road, through such things as ESL classes, as you can see there, and through several other community partners and through street outreach. 70% of eligible cleaners we recruited completed our survey and we collected data from 402 respondents. Our sample was 99% female, their average age was 45. All were immigrants, but on average they had lived in the United States 16 years and most did not feel comfortable speaking English. 44% were the primary family wage earners. Here are a few highlights related to our findings about their employment conditions. In terms of employment stability, 64% had worked five or more years as house cleaners, and 75% were informally self-employed. Related to their earnings, 93% made less than $1,500 per month, 20% worry about having enough clients to meet their needs, and 73% said their earnings were not sufficient to cover their expenses. In terms of workers' rights, 50% were sometimes paid below the minimum wage and couldn't take sick leave, whether paid or unpaid, without fearing retaliation, and 50% also had no health insurance. 33% experienced discrimination at work, most commonly due to the language they spoke or being an immigrant. In terms of work hours, most worked part-time on average 22 hours per week and for three clients per week. We also found that unbalanced relationships with their clients was common, including experiencing time pressures affecting their ability to work safely, lacking control over being able to choose the products they used, experiencing lack of support and even verbal abuse, and problems with communication due to language barriers. We found that exposures to irritant cleaning products was high, as were irritant symptoms. At least 59% of our cleaners use products to clean the bathroom and kitchen that contain quaternary ammonia compounds or bleach two of the compounds associated with respiratory disorders and other irritant health effects in previous studies. And not surprisingly, we also found that work-related irritant symptoms were common. 27% reported work exacerbated skin rash, which was three times higher than a survey of all US workers. 33% reported eye irritation so severe they needed to leave the room where they were working, and 16% reported either work exacerbated asthma or nighttime shortness of breath that improved when away from work. Finally, we also measured workers' mental and self-rated health using standardized scales and then using multivariable logistic regression modeling we found the following predictors of poor mental and self-rated health. First, skin, eye, and respiratory symptoms likely due to their exposure to cleaning chemicals were strongly associated with self-reported uh, health and mental health. 
but so too were their employment conditions, including the dimensions of employment stability, low work-related financial resources, violations of workers' rights, and unbalanced power relations with clients. We completed the survey and we're preparing to start our quantitative exposure assessment in February 2020, right before the COVID-19 pandemic began. So we had to regroup and decide how we could best utilize the challenges and opportunities posed by the pandemic. We decided to pivot towards understanding the burden of COVID-19 on our study population and to develop training and policy actions that would help them handle the COVID crisis. Fortunately, we received a, um, a supplemental grant from NIEHS to complete this sub, sub study. We trained two of our worker leaders to be interviewers and we conducted a 30 minute telephone survey and were able to reach 74% of our original cohort at the beginning of year two of the pandemic between March and June of 2021. Here's a snapshot of our findings, and they very much underscore the disproportionate health and social and economic burdens from the pandemic. 54% reported that they had had COVID-19 by the end of the first year. 57% tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies using a home test kit. And 51% had family or friends who had died of COVID-19 in that first year. We found good vaccine acceptance. 45% overall reported being vaccinated, but since the survey took place just as the vaccine was becoming broadly available, the vaccination rate was 66% for those surveyed after April 2021. 74% of those not yet vaccinated definitely intended to get vaccinated. Related to the impacts of the pandemic on employment, 29% worked during the shutdown between March and June 2020. 64% couldn't take sick leave paid or unpaid during the pandemic without retaliation. 47% said they would be afraid or embarrassed to disclose their COVID-19 status at work. And 62% reported increased exposures to in disinfectant cleaning products. Other social and economic factors uh, included 45% had no fixed place to live or worried about whether they will have a place to live, and 24% and owed more than $1,000 in back rent. 86% sometimes or often experienced food insecurity, and 30% reported experiencing domestic insecurity defined as feeling unsafe inside their home or experiencing int intimate partner verbal abuse. Not surprisingly, we found that both mental health and self-rated health deteriorated over the first year of the pandemic, as you can see the difference between the blue lines and the orange lines. We used logistic regression analysis to examine how both infection related as well as social and economic impacts explain these deteriorations in mental and self-rated health and found the following associations. Related to COVID-19 infections, having COVID themselves or a family member dying of COVID-19 and not yet being um, vaccinated were associated with um, health outcomes. Related to employment, we found that feeling stigma at work if they reported that they had had COVID-19, inability to work during the shutdown period because they might infect their clients with COVID-19, and also food insecurity, housing insecurity, and domestic insecurity were all associated with either uh, mental health or self-rated health deteriorations. Finally, we asked participants who they trust to give them accurate information about COVID-19. While healthcare and public health institutions ranked highly, 
Interestingly, community-based organizations were as commonly considered a trusted source of information. In a minute, when you hear from Daisy about the amazing work of our partner organization, Make the Road New York, you will understand why. So finally, after waiting two years, we've been able to start collecting our quantitative exposure measures. I wanna highlight one aspect of that process. The cleaners who have been involved in our study have helped us in designing this exposure assessment process. We call these cleaners citizen scientists, and they have helped us in our laboratory at Mount Sinai Medical Center by explaining specifically how they do their work and then allowing us to measure exposures while they're cleaning. You can see here one of these citizen scientists who first choose their products uh, that they would typically use, and then we capture with video while they're working and also collect direct continuous measures of the volatile organic compounds while they do these tasks. So now I'll turn it over to Daisy to talk about our various community action campaigns. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Sobel, as well. And thanks again to the Environmental Health Center at the University of Michigan for having us today. As you can see from Sherry's presentation, our research team got relevant research findings about the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on the cleaners that participated in our study. Therefore, the challenge and opportunity at the same time have been how to use the community participatory research framework to translate research findings into action to contribute to workers' health and safety. I'm glad to share the most important actions Major New York has led so far. Next, please. Using the social ecological framework that most of you are familiar with, Make Your Own Your has led many actions at different levels, from educational activities, such as training, workshops, and educational videos, to advocating for legislative initiatives as the Fund Square Workers cancel rent and coverage for all campaigns, which I will be talking more about later on my presentation, which initially required organizing household cleaners and working in collaboration with other networks and coalitions. Next, please. In 2018, um, right after our project uh, started, Mater New York created La Super Cleaners Group, which is basically a safe space for household cleaners to meet, learn, and work together to increase awareness about environmental toxins and health impacts among household cleaners, to reduce exposure to harmful cleaning chemicals, and strive for transformation in their workplaces and personal well-being as women. Around 50 cleaners have been meeting regularly to address these issues. Some of them are also actively, actively engaged uh, in Make Your New York committees, such as the Immigration and Housing Committees. Before the pandemic, they used to meet in person, as you can see on the pictures in this slide, but due to the pandemic, those meetings are now happening virtually. Organizing these workers has been one of the first steps towards building capacity to support upcoming actions. As household cleaning work is isolated, having a safe space for them to connect with other workers has been crucial in understanding the common problems they are facing. Thank you. During the pandemic, many household cleaners lost their jobs, and that's something that we well documented through our research. And the ones that kept working were deeply concerned about performing their work under safer conditions. In that context, uh, the leaders of La Super Cleaners Group created educational videos in Spanish aimed at household cleaners about cleaning during COVID-19, disinfecting product use, returning to work, protecting yourself after cleaning, and mental health care. These videos were widely distributed throughout Metro New York social media, reaching hundreds of workers. You can find them on our website as well. Next, please. Creating educational materials has been one of the initial priorities for our team, especially at the early stage of our project. And one particular outcome has been developing the safe and just cleaning, safer use of chemicals in household cleaning work curriculum. This curriculum was used to implement a train, a train the trainers program in February 2020, right before the pandemic started. At that time, 17 cleaners completed a program and graduated as trainers. The idea initially was that they will deliver this training in person, but later on, due to the pandemic, we needed to adapt it to be delivered online. After learning how to deliver online training, Major on your members, Flaviana, Reina, and Sylvia, household cleaners themselves, and leaders of the Super Cleaners Group have trained 80 household cleaners in New York City. Next, please. 
In the process of expanding our actions to better address exposure to harmful cleaning chemicals, in 2020, we started collaborating with the Cancer-Free Economy Network, a journey that has been very successful. The Cancer-Free Economy is a national network that um, has as members many other organizations that are also working on environmental health issues. The network has provided technical expertise and funding to support La Super Cleaners group activities and some campaign initiatives. After almost two years of being actively involved in this national network, the Household Cleaners Safety Lab Working Group was created, which is a cross-node collaboration committed to designing and testing solutions for reducing exposures to cleaning products among household cleaners. In collaboration with other members' organizations like Women Voices for the Earth and Silent Spring Institute, the lab has developed an educational campaign targeting household employers, aiming at reducing the use of disinfectants and consequently reducing cleaners' exposure to harmful chemicals. This is a relevant campaign, as we found in our research that in many cases, employers are the decision makers when it comes to which cleaning products are used at their homes, without considering the impact of those harmful chemicals uh, that those harmful chemicals could have on the workers they hire or their own family. Even though Make the Roads collaboration ended last year, it's very exciting to see that the network has embraced this initiative and continues working to promote a safer workplace for household cleaners. And if you want to learn more about these videos, I'm going to share the link to the network's website later on during after my presentation. Next, please. There is so much evidence by now about the disproportionate impact of the pandemic in communities of color and low-income workers, as the cleaners that participated in our study. I've seen firsthand how many Make the Road New York members and immigrant workers lost their jobs, their relatives got sick and experienced high levels of economic insecurity. In that context, Make the Road New York, in coalition with other community organizations, advocated creating a fund for immigrant undocumented workers who were excluded from other federal COVID-related economic stimulus programs. In June 2021, the Fund Excluded Workers Coalition led to the appropriation of $2.1 billion for economic support for immigrant undocumented workers. This funding was distributed rapidly, and it was gone in less than two months. Some of the cleaners from our study were able to get this benefit. This huge win was only possible thanks to the perseverance of hundreds of workers that went on the streets to advocate for this campaign. Currently, the Fund Square Workers Coalition is advocating to create an unemployment bridge program aiming to provide compensation to workers who are excluded from regular unemployment insurance because of their immigration status or because of the kind of work they do. These include cash economy workers like street vendors, household cleaners, construction workers, among others. Next, please. Similar to the economic insecurity, the housing, pro the housing problem was a big concern for many New York residents that couldn't afford to pay the rent due to COVID-19 to do the COVID-19 impact. The Council Red campaign advocated creating a fund to support workers that lost their job and couldn't pay the rent. It also prohibited evictions. Make New York, along with the Housing for All Coalition, secured a 2.4 million rent relief program, which covered up to 12 months of back rent utility uh, or utility bills. Next, please. As Cherry mentioned earlier, our research found that nearly half of household cleaners that participated in our study lacked health coverage at the time they were interviewed. Based on that research funding, La Super Cleaners Group decided to support the Coverage for All campaign, which seeks to expand health coverage to all New Yorkers, including its immigrant residents who are currently excluded from enrolling in coverage because of their immigration status. Make the New York has been advocating to pass the Coverage for All legislations for the past six years. In 2022, last year, New York State expanded health coverage for people over 65 years old, independently of their immigration status. This year, the C4A coalition keeps advocating to pass this legislation fully to grant access to health services to all New Yorkers, regardless of their immigration status. Cleaners have been sharing their testimonies and mobilizing to support this campaign. Next. Even though studying environmental exposures is indeed complex, this research is an important contribution to better understanding the social context in which exposures occur and how research findings can be linked to education, organizing, and policy actions. I would like now to highlight keynotes based on what Sherry, Isabel, and I presented so far. 
First of all, economic insecurity. Next, please. Economic insecurity, lack of health coverage, and poor working conditions are factors that threaten workers' health and safety. That's something that it's undeniable. We can see directly the link between socioeconomic conditions, working conditions, and how this impacts directly workers' health. And that's something that has been well documented by our study. Next, please. Research findings also help to advocate for policies that can directly benefit study participants. And this is an interesting opportunity, especially if you are working on a community-based participatory research project and you are working with community organizations that particularly are interested in doing policy work and advocacy work to pass some legislative initiatives at the city, state, or federal level, just to be able to see the link between what you are finding through your research and how these can be translated into actions and especially policies that could impact directly the community that you've been working with. Um, next, please. In terms of COVID-19, it's pretty clear how the pandemic has highlighted the urgency to increase health and safety protections at the workplace, particularly for workers at risk at the cleaners of our study, and especially for low-income workers, immigrant workers, essential workers that were called during the pandemic, but many of them didn't have access to personal protective equipment or safety measures. And that's something that we should definitely consider how to address uh, urgently in, in, in the near uh, future. Next, please. Workers organizing works, and that's something that us is at the core of the work that Make the Run New York does. All victories and campaigns won are the result of multiple actions led by community organizations. And that only shows the power of organizing and the power of working directly with the community. Next, low-income low workers are experiencing high levels of stress due to the pandemic. Accessible mental health services and programs are urgently needed. That's something that we also have seen firsthand. The stress that workers have been under during the pandemic, especially essential workers that couldn't stop working, couldn't perform their work over Zoom, needed to go out, needed to expose themselves to get COVID. Um, we also, through our through our research, documented how that has impacted their mental health in terms of increasing levels of anxiety and depression. So mental health services are, are definitely needed and everyone, regardless of, of their immigration status, should have access to them. Um, and finally, the next one is community organizations uh, such as Make the Road New York, among many others, are key players in addressing health disparities and structural racism. And they should get all the support to keep building a safe and healthy workplace for everyone. There are many organizations out there that are doing this work by themselves. And I we've seen directly through the experience of working in this project how if you use the right approach when you are working on a community-based participatory research project, the community organization could be benefit from it as well. Thanks again for having us. I'm hoping that more researchers get excited about working collaboratively with community organizations and putting in practice the CVPR framework. For those interested in learning more about our project, please visit our website, safeandjustcleaners.org. Thank you for your time and consideration to your time and attention to our presentation. And thanks to Amy also for the invitation. Wonderful. Thank you so much for our panelists uh, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, it's really inspiring to hear about this work. Um, not only the, the wonderful research findings that you've had, but also the way that you have been able to use those to support campaigns uh, to, to promote health. And I think, Daisy, it's especially inspiring to hear about the successes that you've had in supporting workers, um, not only around safe cleaning products, but also um, access to health care and health insurance, um, housing and rent relief, and in so many other um, areas that are absolutely fundamental, of course, to um, supporting health and well-being. So thank you very much. We have a lot of questions that are coming in for you guys. Uh, it's clear that folks have been uh, tracking and are very engaged with the work. So I am going to put the questions out there, um, give you guys a chance to, to respond to them. 
And I'm going to just walk, walk through these in the order in which they have come in. And again, for those of you who are participating, uh, feel free if you have questions to pop them into the Q&A um, and we will work our way through. So the first question is this, as someone who is interested in CBPR among Latinx communities, I am wondering how you gained the trust of undocumented immigrants to participate or if that was an issue at all. I could say that one. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, that's such a good question. I think in our case, um, Make the Road is an organization that has been working with the Latinx immigrant community with low income workers and documented immigrants for so long here in New York, more than 10, 20 years. So th that relationship and that trust has been already built over those years. So when we got into this partnership, uh, I think working directly with an organization that has that level of trust in the community is key. So that's what I will say. So in our case, I felt that it was not necessarily an issue because the organization already had that level of trust in the community. However, as we were working with household cleaners, and that was a particular type of workers that the organization has not necessarily involved with initially, um, we had to get in contact with them. And I will say that the challenge was not necessarily trusting or not our organization. It was more reaching out to these workers. And that initial process of doing outreach, doing a street outreach, getting in contact with them, getting to know them, and, and, and trying to, like, you know, uh, organize them in a way. That was what initially was challenging, I will say. Uh, however, creating a super cleaners group was an interesting strategy because it was needed to have a safe space for these workers to be able to connect and to be able to get to know to each other and also get closer to the organization and has act, have, having access to the many services that we provide as well. So I hope that answers your question or otherwise, please let me know. Thank you, Daisy. Sherry or Isabel, anything to add to that? I think she covered it well. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. The next question is, uh, how was precarious employment conceptualized? Was it based on employment characteristics or the exposure to the chemicals? So that's that's a great question. Um, and, you know, Isabel and I, in a separate research project have actually been exploring this whole question of what does precarious employment mean? So I think that whoever asked the question hit the nail on the head. Um, I think for, um, and others can, can give their answers. I think, you know, all those things are important, um, but for us, the concept of precarious employment, I think predominantly had to do with the nature of their uh, employment relationship and all the different dimensions that we mentioned in terms of employment conditions, in terms of the, you know, employment arrangement being informal, self-employed, um, not really being having their their workers' rights protected, um, you know, having not being able to get access to full employment that would be able to support their um, needs, uh, all of those things, in addition to exposures to um, unsafe conditions, I think characterize um, precariousness. Thank you, Sherry. Isabel or Daisy, anything to add to that? I mean, um, in terms of process, um, when we were trying to figure out all the measures that we wanted, we had to balance, you know, wanting to learn all of the um, things that Sherry just mentioned uh, with what, you know, Make the Road also wanted. Basically, we all wanted the same. We all had the same goal. We all had the same idea. Um, Make the Road, as I mentioned um, earlier, you know, wanted us to ask more questions related to this, not only for this research, but also for other campaigns that were important to them. But also we had to balance this with like, you know, not a administering a two hour survey. So we did a lot of back and forth of like, you know, prioritizing that and it was really difficult. Um, but in the end it worked, you know, it wasn't uh, generally in about an hour survey, maybe sometimes more. Um, so we all um, accepted that that was going to be acceptable. And the way we did it was, um, you know, which gets at other process oriented um, 
you know, aspects of CBPR research, you know, like the, we had, you know, not, we had the research team, you know, also we call the research team, you know, personnel from Make the Road, you know, who all took their IRB, um, you know, sort of courses, you know, that the university wanted. So as a team, everyone, we made that decision to administer in person. This was originally the original survey was prior to the pandemic. Uh, so we prioritized those uh, methods of um, administration of the survey. So, you know, we said, yes, it's going to take a while, but we tried to make the process as best as possible with um, the different uh, ways we did that. Um, but yes, that's that's what I wanted to add. Thank you, Isabel. Daisy. Sure, and maybe just to answer the second part of the question, which is if the conceptualization was more connected to employment characteristics of or exposure to chemicals. I think that if you take a look at our, at our research findings, you will find a lot about like working conditions, particularly because as Isabel mentioned, that was something that for Make the Road was very important to document. Uh, however, there is also an association or relation in, between like the exposure that these workers have specifically because of the working conditions that they are that they currently have you know the informality of the work and uh, how they perform their work the products that are not used necessarily by them but are used by are, are, are chosen by their their employers so there are a bunch of different um characteristics that are contributing to that exposure somehow but it was not necessarily i wouldn't say choose intentionally because of that it was because we wanted to document employment uh sorry working conditions thank you daisy and i want to apologize for um disappearing off the screen periodically i'm in a room where the lights turn off automatically if i don't <laughs> move around so i have to get up and wave my arms every once in a while sorry about that um, okay, the next question is, did you develop a summary score for all of the categories of employment conditions, or did you stick primarily with descriptive statistics as you were working your way through the results? Yeah, so I, I didn't want to bog everyone down in the, the nitty gritty of our analysis. What we did was we, um, using our framework, um, we theorized that certain um, kinds of questions would be able to um, be turned into scales. So what we did is we we asked the individual questions, but then we did principal component analysis to create um, scales within the employment um, conditions, employment quality categories. So um, all of our items were eventually reduced down to can't remember the exact number, like 10 or 12 scales. Um, so. Thank you, Sherry. Um, all right, we're getting lots of great questions in here. So the next one is great presentation. Thank you for this important work. And can you please share a little bit about your process for connecting with the community organization? So I think Sherry and Isabel, this is for you, but D Daisy may have some something to say also. Um, how long did it take you to establish the relationship? So um, we've been working with Make the Road for a long time, <laughs> um, you know, maybe somewhere around uh, 10, 10 plus years. And it first started with a collaboration around, um, well, there was a previous collaboration years in, ago, but during Superstorm Sandy, we renewed that collaboration and um, did a lot of work with mainly construction workers as Isabel first um, described. And so that collaboration went on for several years and we provided free personal protective equipment and training during Superstorm Sandy to a lot of the workers working in um, uh, reconstruction and cleanup. So we had a, a deep relationship with the organization and a lot of trust. And so this that put us in a good position to think creatively about what new collaboration would would meet our interests, the organization's interests. And then of course you have to think practically about what you can get NIH to fund. Um, so, you know, those three things came together, but we were very fortunate to 
conceive of the whole research idea together because we had this previous sort of longer term trusting relationship with the organization. Daisy, do you want to add anything from your perspective? I will say that the, the trust was already there before we started working on this particular project, uh, especially because, as Cherry mentioned, there was this long history of already been working in other projects prior to getting into this five-year collaboration. Um, so uh, I would say that was key. And, and during the process of working together, what primarily, I would say, has worked is just being in constant communication, just being coordinated, just having regular meetings, being involved in the process of designing the survey and choosing which questions matter for the organization, not only for the researchers, and also being able to be fully free to lead and direct the action component of this project and just saying like, okay, this is exactly what we're finding and this, and probably when we think about like community-based participatory research projects, probably for, from the perspective of researchers like doing only trainings or educational activities might be more than enough. And sometimes Sherry told me, that's fine, <laughs> we're doing a lot. And for us, because of the nature of the organization, because it's an organization that does a lot of um, political advocacy and that is um, very committed to transform uh, the workplaces for, for low-income workers, it was very important to, especially in the context of the pandemic, to truly answer urgently to the needs of the community. And in the pandemic where like, there was this economic needs, there was like the need of having housing and being secure and access to health coverage. And that's where we focus and, and the cleaners themselves decided to push forward to, to advocate for those campaigns as well. So I think just, that kind of leadership that was provided and that the organization, the community organization has had during during the, the, the collaboration that, that we've had, I think was crucial as well in solidifying the relationship among the, the different organizations that were involved. Great. Thanks, Daisy. And as always, our 50 minutes goes by so fast. We have two really great questions. I'm going to that left and we have two minutes left. So I'm going to read them both and let you guys decide how you want to respond. So the first is, have you been able to measure the impact of the lost super cleaners? groups, educational videos. And then the second question, also very important, have you been able to involve politicians and states, state stakeholders in the campaigns? If so, can you can't explain a little bit about the process to involve stake, stakeholders that are not necessarily community organizations? So in 60 seconds or less. <laughs> so I, I can quickly talk about the evaluation. I mean, it, it's been very challenging to do because, you know, we're in such a, with the pandemic, everything's changing all the time. But I think uh, informally, what we found is that, you know, as the cleaners participate, like one of the issues that we've run into is we're now doing exposure assessment and many of our cleaners have been transformed by the process. So therefore, the work that they do, they do it differently than they did when we started. And we just have to figure that into our exposure assessment that we're now actually measuring exposures in workers who are very sensitized to the issues of exposure and actually clean differently than they did before. But doing like formal evaluation has been kind of challenging given everything going on. We also Thank had you. limited funding for the evaluation of those videos. So we do have to um, say that much, um, but yeah. One of the challenges of participatory research, right? Things evolve as you go along and they're not always what you had planned to do or, or got funding for. What about engaging policy, policy makers, decision makers um, in some of the, ca the campaigns? Yeah, so Daisy, you should take that one. Sure thing. So for the campaigns that I presented today, many of these campaigns, we have elected officials that are the sponsors of these bills and that are 
particularly politicians who are supporting these initiatives. We, we work closely with them. And during the whole process of advocating to pass these legislative initiatives into the budget, which is this is that's happening right now here in New York. Um, that's a process of, you know, our members are calling legis legislators, are calling assembly members, are doing phone banking, we organize actions, we organize town halls, and we create a space for connect with them. And also particularly for those who are not necessarily as supportive as, as our allies. In terms of connecting with other organizations besides community organizations, as I mentioned during my presentation, we established like a really nice um, and a strong um, collaboration with the Cancer Free Economy Network, which is a national network. And many of the organizations that are members of this uh, network are not necessarily community organizations, are also academic institutions and other type of organizations that are interested in uh, contributing to a safer workplace. And through that network, we were able to also not only get some funding, but also to thinking about sustainability, create a the space for them to keep advocating in terms of, of, of reducing exposures at, at the workplace for household cleaners. And that's a collaboration that is ongoing and it's happening independently of the, the work that we've been doing. All right, thank you all. I wanna ask the audience to join me in thanking this incredible team of presenters and thank you for sharing um, the, this really amazing and inspiring work. Um, it is wonderful to hear about such a successful project, project and to hear some of the strides that you have been able to make through this collaboration. Um, so thank you all for making time to, to present with us today. I also want to invite those who are the participants. Um, our next session in the research and um, residents and researchers series is going to be February 21st, also at noon. Our title is Advancing Environmental Health and Justice, a Call for Assessment and Oversight of Healthcare Waste. Our presenters will be Vincent Martin, um, Omega Wilson and Denise Patel. Um, and that session will be moderated by Natalie Sampson. So please join us. Um, and thanks again, everyone. I hope the speakers are looking. There's lots of kudos coming in for you in the in the chat um, and also in the Q&A. Thanks, everyone. Take Thank you care. very much for having us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.